Tonight's classic, a story about a man named of Oscar Goodman. We called him the mouthpiece because when we first met Goodman back in 1986, he'd gotten himself a reputation as a mob attorney, dubbed the mouthpiece for the mob, mostly because of the alleged gangsters he represented, among them Meyer Lansky, Nick Civella, Tony the Ant Spilatro. Well, things have changed since that story. Now he represents the voters of Las Vegas. For earlier this year, in a city long concerned about its past ties to the mob, the mouthpiece for the mob was elected mayor of Las Vegas. During my entire professional life, I was fighting the government from the outside. Right. And I said to my wife one morning, I said, you know, sweetheart, wouldn't it be great if I could fight them from the inside and keep them honest? And she said, go for it. When Goodman announced his candidacy, the odds makers called him a long shot, and they were not alone. The 60-year-old Goodman had no political experience. Good, I'm running for mayor, as you know. Plus that former client list that many argued made him an unlikely candidate. His hometown paper came out against him. Ooh, you know, if I was a dead person, I wouldn't even have been cold by, by the time I read the, the editorial. I, I filed on a Friday, Sunday morning's paper, headline, Anybody but Oscar for Mayor. Not only was it anyone but Oscar in the Las Vegas Review Journal, I don't know who it was that wrote, considering Mr. Goodman as the official spokesman for Las Vegas is like considering Bill Clinton as headmaster of the school for wayward girls. Oh, jeez, I didn't read that one, but that's pretty good. Yeah. And there were others. Is Vegas remarrying the mob? He has too much blood-soaked baggage. So who was this attorney who during the campaign was called the barrister to butchers? We take you back to 1986, when we first met him. Goodman welcomed me to his lavish Las Vegas law offices, dubbed by law enforcement people, the house the mob built. Here's my favorite room. This is uh, referred to as the Godfather's room by some members of law enforcement. Over a period of two decades, Goodman has defended people like the late Meyer Lansky, the late Nick Civella, and Anthony Spilatro, men the FBI identifies as leaders of the mob. Are you a mob lawyer? What mob? I'm simply asking, are you a mob? No, I'm a good lawyer. I'm a lawyer who defends citizens who are accused of crime. Period. Period. Now, I can't help it if these uh, monkeys out there want to call me a mob lawyer. That's their problem. Well, you represent. Maya Lansky used to represent. Nick Savella. All right, are they mobsters? Anthony Spilatro. Who calls them mobsters? I think that the general perception has been that Lansky, Civella, and Spilatro are members of organized crime. Well, all I can tell you, Mr. Wallace, is that, in my opinion, they're used as scapegoats because of law enforcement's inability to control the streets and the uh, epidemic of crime in the streets. They have to create monsters, and they create them. These people are human beings. They're citizens. Why do so many mobsters, or alleged mobsters, come to Oscar Goodman? Uh, they feel that they can trust me. They know that I won't give them up. They know that uh, when they come to me, I'm not going to be representing other clients who are cooperating against them. And Goodman uh, condemns the government's use politics. of professional witnesses who have turned against their former colleagues. He says they are paid to perjure themselves. So a man like uh, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano? No, a piece of garbage. And let him sue me. Really? A piece of garbage. Because? Because he's a liar and because he's living off of our tax dollar. Joe Valachi? Uh, another real genius punk. So where do the people Oscar Goodman represents, like Tony Spilatro, where do they get their money? In order for Tony Spilatro to retain Oscar Goodman, he's got to have a lot of money. Where does the money come from? I assume whatever monies I get from I don't ask him. All I know is when Mr. Spilatro is with me, he's a kind, decent, attentive, genteel person. This man who was alleged to have this man who is a creation of law enforcement's puts, vivid imagination. Put somebody's head in a vise until the eyes popped out? I represented him on that case, and the judge found that the witness who testified as to the vice and the eyes and all of that nonsense uh, was a liar. Is it conceivable, Mr. Goodman, you're just turning your eyes away from where your clients get their money? You don't want to ask too many questions? Intent, intentional ignorance of where they get their money? No, it's not relevant as to where they get their money as far as I'm concerned. They're irrelevant. To, to me, it's irrelevant as to where they get their money. The grocer doesn't ask where they get their money. The podiatrist, the chiropractor, the doctor, they don't ask. Why should I have to ask? But as in defending drug dealers, the lawyer who defends racketeers also has his nervous moments. There were a couple of clients who had a dispute, 
And instead of going to the courts over their dispute, they went to me as an arbiter. And uh, we were in my office. And one of the clients was sitting over here, and one of the clients was sitting over there. And I closed the door, and I wanted to hear what the problem was. What was the problem? It doesn't really matter what the problem was, but unfortunately, I leaned against the light switch. <laughs> the lights went out, and I got to be honest with you, I was a little concerned at that point. I hit the floor. That was Oscar Goodman, the criminal defense attorney. And what does Mayor Goodman have to say today about his former clients? People want me to apologize for my uh, background. Really, uh, it's amazing. They want me to say that I'm sorry I represented people who were accused of crime. And to be honest with you, I, am, uh, I never had a bad day. Always looked at myself in the mirror. Didn't see a particularly pretty face, but uh, I was always proud of what I did. Even when you defended Maya Lansky? It didn't matter who I defended, as long as I defended them in the manner in which I did. Tony the Ant Spilatro. My relationship with him was a good relationship. Law enforcement said that he killed 22 people, and then he himself was killed, uh, beaten to death, and buried in an Indiana cornfield. This is the man? That's the man. And you said that you'd rather your daughter went out oh, with Tony Spilatro than, than, than with an FBI agent. All I wanted to do was be the mayor. <laughs> do, I, do I have to relive that line every day of my life? It's former clients like Spilatro and Lansky that caused some to worry that Goodman is mayor would dredge up the Vegas of yesteryear, a mob-run town, that he would sully the image the new Las Vegas has worked so hard to build. Look, Las Vegas is now trying to promote itself as a mecca for family entertainment, right? Uh, that's what uh, the party line is. Uh, I I'm a great believer that it has to have the mystique that it's had in the past. Which means? Which means that uh, I think uh, people want to... Uh, when they come out there, if they wanted to go to Disneyland, they could drive another 200 miles, okay? When they come out there, they don't want to see Mickey Mouse under a rock. They want to see a little Bugsy Siegel. I, I really believe that. I'm sorry that I missed him, but I've been tied up all day, and I just got the message. So, okay. how did Oscar Goodman go from mouthpiece for the mob to mouthpiece for Las Vegas? How did he launder himself? Well, he didn't get off to a promising start. Uh, I'm at my first debate. Uh, I think I'm into the campaign maybe three, three days. And some fellas uh, sent up like a, a straw man uh, by one of my opponents. And he asked me a question, which he knew the answer to. He said, how many city council meetings have you ever been to? Well, the answer was zero. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what a city council meeting was when I ran for office. And uh, after he asked the question and I started to answer him, he turned around and walked away. And I said, wait a second. Come on back here if you're going to ask me a question like that. Look at me when I'm answering you well. I can't believe what the public said about that one. You can't speak to people that way. Sure I can. Why, why, why be something other than yourself? During the campaign, it's reported that you used to say, fairly frequently and with a big grin, I'm running for mayor. I need your financial support. And if you don't... Well, I was, I was trying to be a little... If you don't give it to me, I'll well, have you whacked. Well, not whacked. I, 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 Goodman I, maintains what he actually did say was inspired by a movie he appeared in. I used a line from my casino days when I was there with De Niro and Pesci and Sharon Stone. I said, if you don't give it to me, I'm going to bring in Pesci to break your legs. Uh, it's not exactly having a whack. Okay. Goodman played himself in Casino, a film about the mob's control of a Las Vegas casino during the 1970s. We have documents which completely absolves Mr. Rothstein from any wrongdoing. I'd like this uh, That was part of, uh, part of me. I, if I were a podiatrist, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Nobody would be interviewing me. I'd be another mayor, but I am myself, and I don't apologize for it. And during his campaign, he did not apologize for his past either. What he did do was put forward a side of Oscar Goodman rarely seen in public. He used television to embrace family values with a TV commercial featuring what he called his five best accomplishments. And it didn't hurt when some repeat some of his former courtroom adversaries endorsed him. Oscar was one of the best examples of a guy that uh, was a very vigorous and, and, and tough, tough fighter, but he never crossed the line. When all was said and done, Oscar Goodman won in a landslide, capturing 64% of the vote. And it didn't take long for his honor to be honored by Las Vegas' number one industry on the face of a negotiable casino chip. I really uh, have to find out how our lobbyists back in Washington are doing. Goodman now spends long hours learning the ropes of running Las Vegas. There was no interest without there the betting. There was no interest without the betting. Isn't that amazing? Talking to his constituents and thoroughly enjoying the perks of his job. You know where we're going now? The airport to meet the president. So it's, it's the best. As mayor of Las Vegas, it was Goodman who was first to greet Bill Clinton on a recent trip there. 
And it was not the first time the two men had spoken. The day that I was elected, I get back uh, to the office, and there's a, the secretary says, the White House called. I said, oh, will you stop it? He said, the president called to congratulate you. I said, will you forget about it? So I had one message at 4.55 and one message at 5 o'clock. The one at 5 o'clock was the White House and President Clinton. The one at 4.55 was a former drug dealer that I represented both congratulating me. <laughs> so I said, that says it all. As mayor, Oscar Goodman has limited power. He has just one vote on a city council of five members. But the council is where this persuasive gentleman uses the bully pulpit to try to sway this particular jury to vote his way. Motion carries. And Oscar says that whatever he wants, he seems to be getting. What he wants most is to become the best mayor Las Vegas has ever had. I didn't need this job. I wanted the job. But I really want to make a mark. I want to leave a legacy that this place is better because I was the mayor. You going to run for higher office? No, I love this job. I mean, being the mayor... Come on. Oh, I'm dead serious. The, uh, being the mayor of the city of Las Vegas is be better than being president of the United States, better than being governor of Nevada, better th than being a United States senator. It's the greatest. Everybody loves the mayor of Las Vegas. You can't beat it. Oscar B. Goodman. Beautiful, as we all know, our shy and reserved baby barrister greeted the world on July 26th. 51 years ago in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Born to Laura, a then budding artist, and Alan Goodman, an attorney, they had great hopes for their firstborn. Here's a hint that the brilliant attorney had arrived, Oscar in his briefs. Dad was quick to give Oscar his fatherly advice, to study law, hardly. No doubt to bet on the Chicago Black Sox. Interestingly enough, Oscar really was related to the Marx Brothers. No, no, not Harpo. Strange, though, isn't it, that our famous mouthpiece should so resemble the mute. Even at an early age, Oscar seemed to identify with the underdogs. Here, at a little spot on Salmon Lake at Camp Arcadia in Maine, our Oscar poses with friends who are no doubt getting ready to enter their first conspiracy. At Oscar's bar mitzvah, he delivered his first closing arguments, and I believe the rabbi was found not guilty. Then after, characteristically complaining about his gifts, Oscar got his first taste of public adulation. No doubt this probably prompted his great love for acting, which he still gets to practice in the courtroom. And off to college, to Haverford, where Oscar majored in liberal liquid libations, which led to Carolyn. After the wedding, the little couple settled into domesticity in Philadelphia, so Oscar could learn to earn. Carolyn had hoped not to work too long. The University of Pennsylvania Law School saw fit to graduate our budding barrister in 1964. An automatic genius? Not Oscar. 70.1 his first year, and complaining all the way through, but he had made it. His first real love, and the one he always brags about, is sports and athletic prowess. And Oscar has tried them all, sadly mastering none. Oh, he talks a good game, but his best effort is through the Caesars Palace Sportsbook, or as an Olympic quality channel changer. Actually, I take it back. Oscar works out vigorously once a year for 10 days in Hawaii when he turns into the epitome of virility and health. His modeling career certainly is on the rise. One year, the boys even talked him into going scuba diving. He complained all about his claustrophobia. He went down kicking and screaming, but came up bragging about his exceptional underwater talent. And as with every other sport, Oscar was a natural. Above all, Oscar is a pure family man. The children are the very heart and soul of his life. He and I are both very proud of this photo, probably because it's the first and only time that the four children sat quietly without pinching, biting, or otherwise causing bodily harm to each other. And second, because all four of our children, Oscar Jr., Ross, Eric, and Kara, have brought Oscar and me the greatest amount of joy. They have been the inspiration that has helped Oscar Goodman reach the level of greatness that we are here celebrating tonight. The seeds of greatness were planted in 1964 when Oscar opened his original Las Vegas law firm with Ian Ross, Jerry Snyder, and Richard Bryan. Oscar eventually worked with all the great Nevada politicians. Of course, they all had to deny they ever knew Oscar Goodman to get elected. In fact, if they ever really needed a boost in their campaigns, they just asked Oscar to come out in support of their opponents. It was a sure-fired political kiss of death. 
Anyway, the opening of Oscar's practice began an exciting and unbelievable era in his life. Let Oscar take it from there. You resent the term mob mouthpiece? Uh, no, I don't resent it. As I've often said, if I am the mob mouthpiece, then it assumes there's a mob, and I don't know about that, but if I'm a mouthpiece, that's what I'm supposed to be. I, I speak for the downtrodden, I speak for the oppressed. Sometimes they're rich, sometimes they're poor, sometimes they're black, white, doesn't matter to me. They're people who are accused of crime. They're presumed innocent in this country, thank God. And uh, I will do everything within my power to speak on their behalf. I'm very bullish on uh, Las Vegas and on Nevada. I think it is probably uh, about the worst thing that a state can do to an individual because what the state does is that they create an outlaw. Why would I like the indictment dismissed? <laughs> uh, I would have really earned my fee then. What could I tell you? Why are you going to? Oscar. Everybody wants an Oscar, especially when they're in trouble. Oscar, I'm here. I found out the other day that one of the main reasons why I couldn't come to your roast tonight is that I've been accused of hanging around with unsavory characters. This disturbed me. So what I did do, I went down to the gaming control board, and I wanted to know who were these unsavory characters that I hung around with. Much to my demise, I found out it was you. Congratulations, Oscar, on 25 years in practice. I know it was 22 years ago I started with you as your first associate. If you only pay me a little more money, I might still be with you instead of being a judge today. On the other hand, I know of your devotion and hard work, other people's hard work. I can remember while you were out gallivanting to Miami and to L.A. and to New York, you left Linda and I back in the office to do the pleadings and get out the billings that kept you financed in your travels. On the other hand, I also know that uh, beyond your devotion to the law is your devotion to your family. So I want to wish you and your beautiful bride, Carolyn, and uh, all your children a uh, very wonderful uh, anniversary and uh, wish 25 more years for you of success. Best wishes. Uh, my experience with Oscar Goodman was that I needed a lawyer. I came to Las Vegas to hire him. Went to a flower shop. His office was above a flower shop at the last room, about a two by four room with books all over the floor and everything. So I hired him and brought him back to Kansas City to defend me. When we got there, and when he got there and the case started, the judge ruled that he couldn't try the case because he was a too high priced lawyer, had a too good of reputation as a great lawyer. So that he had to, I had to have him hire another local lawyer, and Oscar had to whisper to him to defend me. The other lawyer did all the work, and Oscar wound up coming back home, and I've been fooling with him since 1971, and I've yet to get him to do anything for me. I have to go to Linda Rogers to get everything. His secretary does everything I want. I pay him, and I get her. <laughs> There's one thing that was so funny one day, I went to the uh, grand jury in the federal building. I took the fifth. I come downstairs. All of a sudden, I bunk into Oscar. I tell Oscar, I took the fifth. He said, how could you take the fifth? You took, the, you took two and a half. I said, no, Oscar, I took the fifth. And he let everybody laugh. What's the joke? I recall the last case we had together. Uh, I was the DA, and you were the defense counsel. A double homicide out in, in um, Bodicey. You, uh, you had an ex-police ex officer, a client, and I did my best to keep in here in Nevada. You got him on bail, and I told you he'd never go to trial if he went back to New Jersey. You paraded his brothers in, a police captain, a fire chief, a legislator, and a, and a lawyer. They all vouched for him, and you all promised that he'd come back, especially you, Oscar. Two years later, when I came on the bench, he had not come back. One year later, he died. Oscar, you lied. I remember about four years ago when the San Francisco 49ers, they won the, their division already and they did not need the last game. And I had lunch uh, with Oscar and he was telling me about what a sure bet that is. And that Minnesota Vikings are gonna win this game with no any problem, that supposedly the quarterback is gonna, from the San Francisco, the quarterback is gonna play like a running back, the running back is gonna play like a receiver. And he said about making a big bet, what a beautiful bet that is. 
Well, the Vikings scored, I believe, the first field goal, and afterward we end up losing 59 to 3 the game. Remember that night you invited me out, just you and me, at McDonald's, candlelight dinner? You ordered a hamburger, and I ordered a milkshake, and we talked about the high cost of food. Oscar, that dinner cost us $1.50. Boy, were you cheap. Mr. Goodman and I were first introduced through mutual friends while I was vacationing in Nevada. He was cited as being a modernized Clarence Darrow. Before I had time to be impressed, Oscar proceeded to make me an offer that I couldn't refuse. A quick glance at his oversized cowboy boots eliminated any thoughts of non-consent. Shortly thereafter, an Arnold Schwarzenegger-type henchman was needed to carry his retainer fee. All those American pesos. As of yet, I still haven't recovered from the shock. Congratulations and good luck, my friend. I love you. Anytime I always called Linda, she always took my number and said, Oscar will call you back. One thing about you, Oscar, you never give anybody a call back. Good luck, Oscar. Oscar goes into the office with the assistant DA, and they're in there for like an hour, and I'm beginning to get very nervous. Finally, Oscar comes out, and he's breaking up. He's laughing. Here's what happened. They had us plead guilty not to a misdemeanor. They had us plead guilty to a, a disorderly conduct charge, allowing an unleashed and unmuzzled dog to walk the streets of Mineola, New York. That's my story. Do you remember that time you were elected president of the temple? And you looked into the crowd, and I was smiling. And when you came off the stage, you said to me, you felt very good because I was smiling. And that made you feel good. Well, Oscar, I felt good, too, that you were elected president of the temple. I appreciate our friendship for all these years, and through all the crises you've helped me through. Oscar, you know that bill I owe you? I decided not to pay. Hello, Oscar. This is James Shannon, a.k.a. you-know-who, calling you from the belly of the beast here. Make that the bowels of the beast here on Old Death Row. Frankly, Oscar, on the whole, I'd rather be in Philadelphia or Tel Aviv without a gas mask. It's been a pleasure knowing you these last three and a half years, even though it started on Friday the 13th, with you telling me bail was out of the question. Let me say, in spite of the bad seat I have for this occasion, I consider myself fortunate knowing you and wish to congratulate you on what can only be considered halftime in a great career. Congratulations on all your accomplishments to present, and I'm sure there will be many, many more forthcoming, especially from one who was a panther at cross-examination and a maestro of motions, who can make prosecutors cringe and defendants cheer for a man who truly realizes that judges are appointed, not anointed. You've given me great confidence knowing you're in my corner. And that makes this country great, the fact that every man's entitled to the best defense money can buy, and baby, you're it. So once again, congratulations to Oscar. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Ringside, love and happiness, James. P.S. Help! Hello, Oscar. I just wanted to congratulate you on your 25 years of making life miserable for prosecutors everywhere. And it's always a pleasure having you on a show of mine. Um, I remember the time you made the statement that there was no mafia, and I thought that was an interesting thing to say on television. Uh, of course, there is no television. Um, but anyway, uh, nice to see you. I, I hope you continue to reign as successfully as you're doing now. And don't ever forget that once you appeared on a show of mine and it was canceled the same day. What can we learn from this? Congratulations. A number of years ago, sitting with Oscar, listening to him complain how he lost money on the commodities market. He had bought pork bellies. And I told him then, ask her, what is a nice Jewish boy like you doing buying pork bellies? Looks like God punished you. Then a few years later, an FBI agent comes up to Oscar's office wired up trying to trap him. Well, he didn't trap him, but the FBI agent's name was Bacon. Oscar, just goes to show you, you better stay away from all pork products. I first met Oscar on December 12th, 1970, when we were raiding the Rose Bowl. And Oscar at that time was representing Lefty Rosen Rosenthal, who was operating the Rose Bowl Sportsbook. Uh, on that date, uh, an individual was at the door with a pair of uh, uh, cut-off jeans and, a, and a, a flowery type Hawaiian shirt demanding entry. As I went to the door, he stated his name was Oscar Goodman. 
and he wanted in. I would not allow him him, him in at that time, uh, stating that uh, we were raiding the Rose Bowl and he had no business there. Eventually, he was allowed in, and from that day on, when Oscar became famous uh, in representing various individuals in wiretapping cases, and I know one day uh, I told Oscar, I said, you have a lot to be thank the FBI for, and he said, what? I said, the FBI made you famous and made you a millionaire. The millions upon millions of dollars that you've charged me over the years at a winning percentage rate of 1.53 may appear to be in balance, but nonetheless, I wouldn't want it any other way. You have been a memorable and super friend. Enjoy the party. Oscar, you're a great man. I wish you all the best, and I hope they don't smoke you too much tonight. Thank you, take care, and score a knockout. I want you to know that I was told to come here and say all the terrible things that I could think of you. Oscar, they told me to blast you. They told me to talk about you like dirt. And I did my homework, but I couldn't think of anything bad to say, Oscar. I think you're a phenomenal lawyer. I think you're a loving father. I think you're a wonderful husband. And I think you're an incredible human being. Oscar, we all love you very, very much. Congratulations on your 25th year. Mazel tov. Needless to say, I wish I could be there tonight to honor not only my lawyer, but also my good friend, Oscar Goodman. There are a lot of things I could say about Oscar that would be humorous, but I'll leave that to the people there tonight. I just want to say that if it wasn't for my friend Oscar, the awesome power of the federal government would have steamrolled me right into the death house. Without Oscar on my side, the scenario that the government played out for me would have been fulfilled. His integrity and honesty cannot be equal in his profession. Thank you, Oscar, for my life. Of course, I'm in my 22nd year with you. There was probably, well, maybe one good one. Um, how many secretaries have a job where you walk into restaurants and bars and you're introduced to people you don't know as secretary to organized crime. People are whispering at you. Uh, you go home at night and in your mailbox you find wiretap inventories from the FBI where you've been bugged on your home telephone. You go to the office and you've been bugged on your office telephone. How many secretaries have gotten grand jury subpoenas from the U.S. Department of Justice strike force investigating organized crime in the Midwest. I mean, it's, it's been incredible. There were some fringe benefits. I remember probably during the first year I worked for you, you told me that I never had to worry about um, any harm coming to me that no one would dare. Um, <laughs> that happened once you were right. I have to admit, one time that happened. I remember I went into a bar one night, uh, or a cocktail lounge after work, and I was sitting next to this nice man, he was a general contractor or something, very nice man, we were talking, I went away from the table, and I came back, and his friend had disappeared, and he says, did you know my friend left? And he said, I should stay away from you, that's your organized crime. He says, how many secretaries do you see in here wearing a mink coat? That, I mean, that sums up everything, but to tell you the truth, I wouldn't give up one minute of it. I've enjoyed all of it. Oscar Goodman, who has been called a mouthpiece for the mob, practices law here in Las Vegas, the town that organized crime helped put on the map. And it's money from organized crime, in addition to drug money, money used for legal fees that the government is after. And some of that, the government says, has gone to pay Oscar Goodman, whose lavish offices have been dubbed by law enforcement people the house the mob built. Here's my favorite room. This is uh, referred to as the Godfather's room by some members of law enforcement. Over a period of two decades, Goodman has defended people like the late Meyer Lansky, the late Nick Civella, and Anthony Spilatro, men the FBI identifies as leaders of the mob. Are you a mob lawyer? What mob? Oscar, to you and all of your mob friends, congratulations on tonight's sit-down. 
When we were two, when we, we were two, we always knew. We always knew. We be doing a rap. We be doing a rap. For you know who. For you know who. Oscar, Oscar. Oscar, Oscar. He's our man. He's our man. From the number one team. From the number one team. In the land. In the land. To Oscar. To Oscar. Who's everyone's fan. Who's everyone's fan. To the number one lawyer. To the number one lawyer. From the number one team. From the number one team. Uh, hey, who in the hell is Oscar? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, to the house that my law enforcement friends have always characterized as the house that crime built. Be assured of one thing, the only way this office was built was with my hard work, notwithstanding anything that Steve or David might tell you. The real boss of the office is up here, my dear wife Carolyn, whose right eye focuses on my desk at all times when she whispers to me, earn, and I'm just the the second most important thing in the office is taking care of uh, uh, Killer and uh, Kilo. Um, and uh, nobody has immunity from uh, not doing their job as far as they're concerned. And if uh, they don't do what they're supposed to do, they too could end up in Lake Mead. All right, now we're here for a good time and my liver is beginning to quiver. So let's go on with the show. Love you. We love you. You're our greatest fan. And our greatest father. 